Nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. Soon as we step out the cage, we raising all of the stakes. Make no mistake, either you stay in your place or we put in you on a plate. Look at our face. We put the fear in the dirt. We had to struggle for change. Pick up the pace. We put in. Hey everyone, welcome to the spot. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Ron. And Tierra's out today, but we had the pleasure of speaking to Gary Lennon, the showrunner of Power Book Four Force, and. It was an amazing discussion. It was a discussion that we had been looking forward to uh, all season. And you guys, I can't wait for you to see it. Um, check it out. Okay, well, I'm, I'm Tiffany from The Spot. And, and I'm Ron, Ron Johnson from The Spot Real Talk. And it is a pleasure to have uh, Gary Lennon with us. You are one of the faves. And we were hoping to get you on. And when Tiffany uh, told us that we have you, you know, I got chills. So take it away, Tim. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we are uh, day one OG Power fans. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. So when we heard that you were going to be at the helm of season two, we're like, oh, wow. And um, that basically leads me to our first question because um, this season feels like OG Power to me. And mm. Tommy feels like OG Tommy to me and I just wanted to know like what was your approach and, and was it a seamless transition like how did you approach this season yeah it's a great question first of all thank you for recognizing that because that was like our ambition that's what we wanted to do and so I think you know when I first you know um got the call that they wanted me to take over the show um I watched all the episodes for season one and then I you know I got a notebook and I wrote down all the things that I didn't wasn't responding to me or didn't feel like the power world and there was a bunch and then you know I had a really great conversation with Joseph who agreed with you know pretty much everything that I said and then 50 also weighed in and he agreed and we decided that you know, we wanted to go back to old school power like where's that feeling where's that touch where's that look where's that you, where's that vibe? There's something that felt like there was no build. Uh, you know, it felt sort of messy in a way. So anyway, my job was in season two to come in and like look at what the story is. It was sort of funny because I kidded around and said, it was like I was handed a giraffe, a Volkswagen, a banana, and a bicycle. And I was said, okay, make a story. And I was like, because I was handed these tools and I had to make a story out of them. And then I just, you know, it was really just about repetition, going through it and seeing where the fat was. Like, this isn't what's needed. You know, the Flynn family felt very arch to me and not part of the power world. And so I, I had to minimize that. And I think what my biggest job was is to go in and like constrict, take away the things that weren't working, but then expand. And hopefully with the Miguel and the Maria and the street and the Mexican, we got to make the world of Chicago black and brown and really reflective of the city that it is, you know? and. Our room, our writer's room is very much of Chicago. You know, we had a, we have a guy in our writer's room who spent like 11 years in prison, who was a heroin addict. And we have a daughter of a cop, Kendra Chapman, who wrote, you know, 202 and mm -hmm. No Streets of Chicago and our crew all from Chicago. So I wanted to make it feel real. That was my biggest thing. It's like, make it gritty, make it real. And 50 was like, make it right now, like all the violence in Chicago. Chicago is one of the most dangerous violent cities in America, mm -hmm. reflect that. And so there's a lot of kills this season, but that was, you know, purposeful. It was to reflect what's happening. You actually took the word out of my mouth, grit. And now that you've explained that, I now understand fully where and why we see the kind of grittiness that we have uh, with Power, uh, Power Book 4. And I'm telling you, I'm, it has us on edge, man. I mean, uh, I, I, I hope it never ends. I, I know that's a big hope. <laughs> hope springs eternal, though. But um, if it can go on forever, I'm with it. But my Thank question you. Uh, for you, uh, and it's more a personal question, um, how did your upbringing from Hell's Kitchen, uh, uh, Midwest uh, uh, Manhattan, how did that influence uh, your work, your style of work? Yeah, you know, it honestly, and I think, you know, even the both of you, if you would ask yourselves of how your upbringing influences your work is, it is everything really, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. DNA, like, 
I come from absolutely nothing. You know, my parents, my mom had two kids by the time she was 14 years old. So that means she had a baby at 13 and another baby at 14. And my father went away, you know, and then he came back out and that didn't go well. And both of my parents were dead by the time I was like 13 years old. Hmm. And my brother was in crime and drugs. And I was sort of very lost. I, I got, I was, I didn't graduate high school, you know, um, I got sober when I was 24 years old. I sort of was an alcoholic from the age of 13 to 24. So a lot of drinking, a lot of hard times. Um, but the great gift of God is that I got sober um, and then that my life changed. And then I was able to use all of that dirt, all of the things I was ashamed of. I never forget being in a writer's room um, one of the first times and they were going around the room asking, you know, where'd you go to school? And people were like, I went to Yale, I went to Juilliard, I went to Columbia. And they came to me and I was so ashamed of my background. And they were like, where'd you go? And I was like, I went to Cannes Bar and Grill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it wasn't until I really owned like my shame. I think shame is such a powerful tool uh, to use as an artist your, your, and your grit and your, your roughness, you know, um, mm. use it in your work. And so I always think that my childhood, my parents, my brothers, their problems, their demons, my demons, they've all allowed me to have a career. So my thing is like that, there's a beautiful quote that I love, which is uh, by Thornton Wilder. And it says, real art is the desire to tell your secret and hide it at the same time. Mm. And so in my writing, I'm always revealing something about my brother, my mom, you know, Kate, there's a lot of my mom and Kate, there's a lot of my brother and, and Tommy. Um, and there's a lot of all the writers in the writer's room reflect their lives in our stories that we're telling. And that's really fun work. That's the good work. So I would say my upbringing, I have a career because of my upbringing, which is sort of like you'd go, really? Like, I thought if you went to Juilliard, you'd have more of a career. Mm. But no, I feel very lucky to be raised the way I was because I feel like the dark days are behind me. Well, coming from the School of Hard Knocks, which you did, and after reading your background, I'm telling you, you are an inspiration to me and hopefully an inspiration mm -hmm. to everyone that watches this program. So kudos to you, brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Man. Absolutely. And your background has helped you breathe life into this franchise and yes. these characters. So it um you are a gift to this franchise. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you know there are no mistakes, there are no coincidences. Absolutely. I walked into the right room at the right time and I found my tribe. Mm -hmm. Um and the rest is history. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, with you saying that, that leads to my question because I know you've worked with Joseph Sakura for a long time, or OG Power. And I was just wondering if there was any advice that you gave him to help lock into the character for, for season two of Force. You know, Joseph is so talented, as you know, um, and he's 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 such a smart actor. I would say that um, I, the only thing I really tell Joseph, he doesn't need a lot of direction. Like I actually, sometimes we've had a guest director and the director, in my opinion, wasn't leading him down the wrong road. And I would go and say, follow your instincts. You need to, you know, this character better than anybody. And so I would say the only thing I could ever say to Joseph to really help with his performance or, or the story is follow your, like, what do you, what's your gut say? You know, he has, he's an incredibly raw, visceral animalistic actor hmm. and if and he always he will go there all you need to do is give him permission and sometimes you don't need him need to give him permission um but what i think joseph really responds to and that i think him and i have such a deep connection is that he feels safe with me and he trusts me and so he knows that when i'm on set with him that i'm going to support his instincts i think a lot of people make a huge mistake in television by saying no to actors repeatedly. And my, I never say no to an actor. I'm always like, let's discuss that. But with Joseph, I think the reason, the, the only thing I could really do to Joe is to be um, supportive because I, his instincts are so good that if he feels safe, you're gonna get everything that you want and more. Well, let me, let, without any spoilers, I do wanna ask this question. What can fans expect from episode nine and more importantly, episode 10? That is that which you can tell us 
because yeah, yeah, yeah. we're on the edge. <laughs> yeah. Well, episode nine really, I think, leads off with the question is, we have a problem. We have a snitch, a snitch among us. Mm -hmm. And then the whole episode is in pursuit of that. And then at the end of the episode, the big reveal is, is that Tommy realizes that Vic is the snitch. And we end the episode on Tommy's face going, Oh my God, what the, how the, you know, what the hell, what the F's going to happen now? Like, mm -hmm. and then we answer that question in 10. Um, and then on the diamond side of things, you know, he wants to get um, retaliation for, you know, whoever sent his parole officer his way. And then him and Gennard are going to buddy up. Their relationship is getting more full as brothers and um, they'll take care of that situation as well. And then in 10, I think that we've taken every single character that we have on our chessboard and we have brought them to their back is against the wall. And a couple of things happen, I won't give away, but it's basically who will live and who will die. And we will answer that question given a season three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, you know, one thing that I noticed like I, I like the alliance with um, Diamond and Tommy because um, Diamond's character reminds me of Ghost a little bit because he's methodical and Tommy is Tommy. You know, Tommy is very reactionary and stuff, even though he's moving more strategic these days. Um, but I see Gennard is planting seeds in, in Diamond's um, ear and in his head and stuff. And I'm feeling like, I, that makes me nervous because blood is sticking in water. And I said to Ron earlier in the in the season, I, I told them, I had predicted before it had even happened. I said, Gennard and, and is going to come back into the fold. I knew it. I said, because I said, the bottom line is they are still brothers. And Diamond used to run CBI before. And then now you have Gennard in his ear saying, hmm, you know, like, Time, you know, we're taking orders from him, this, that, and the other. And I just, I just, I I feel like, and this is only my prediction, but I feel like season three is kind of leading us to a break. You know, like, may, like maybe Tommy and Diamond won't be so connected anymore. Like maybe Diamond will choose his brother. And, and I, I don't know. And I could be wrong, but I, but I, Denard, you know, in his ear that way, and them getting back close. What I'm seeing, I'm like, mm, I don't yeah. want. Yeah, yeah, no, great assessment, by the way, a hundred percent. And I would say you're you're responding exactly the way the writers' room wants our audience to respond. Okay. We, we want their closeness, inching them closer together, Denard and Diamond, to be a thorn in, in Tommy's side and a problem for him. And how? And we we're going to answer that question, like you said in season three, if we get to season three, is will Gennard, will is blood, that's one of the themes that I'll be writing towards, is blood thicker than water, mm -hmm. uh, you know, honestly. And so everything you're saying is by, trust me, in the writer's room, we've all discussed it, and we have a plan of how to dramatize that in season three. But your, your instincts are very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was just like, mm. I told them early on. I was like, listen, this is his brother at the end of the day. Like, I mean. Well, I, I have to say that uh, Tiffany and I, we're point counterpoint on a lot of things, but um, she was right. I'm going to give it to her. And <laughs> let me do, let me say this uh, in all honesty. It has been an absolute pleasure having you with us today. And if you ever have a, a moment to come back and, 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 maybe uh, give us some insight or your insight after uh, season 10, uh, episode 10, that is, we'd be more than happy to have you. But uh, I would love to. Been, this has been an I would love to. Let's, I, let's orchestrate that through Jordan. I would love to. So yeah. yes, well, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah, I'll come back. We'll play. I love that would it. be great because um, <laughs> we, we have these round tables with fans. Yes. And what we've been doing in last season, we actually had a round table um, with fans with Isaac Keys, uh, Anthony Fleming, and Chris Lofton. And so what we do, we, we kind of surprise the fans. We don't let them know that we're going to have the talent and stuff. We we invite them on to talk about the, the show. And then we involve the talent and they get to ask questions. And it's, it's a whole lot of fun. So we would love to have you on to, you know, have the fans pick your brain and everything. 
Love it. Count me in. I'm in 100% my word. <laughs> excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thank well, you like, so much. And enjoy, and, and, um, enjoy your afternoon. We really love it. And I, I tell you, you guys, you keep feeding us treasure. So good. just keep doing it because I, I love every second of it. But thank you so thank much. You thank okay. you so much. Peace. Bye -bye, I'll guys. see you again. We'll be at the table. Excellent. Yes, you will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's heavy. F -f Famous love. Yeah, I gotta keep it trendy on my soul. I'm the most selfish person that I know. Here we go down the rabbit hole. Got a couple carrots from my neck. Self-respect. When you out of line, you put yourself in check. Oh. They don't hear me. They don't, they don't, they don't hear me though. Cycles going around and around and around like a merry go. Stand for truth or fall for any old scenario. That's why I keep my circle smaller than a cherry. Oh.